Turn to number 160, please. 160. Are you washed in the blood? We'll sing the chorus after one and four. Let's stand. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Will your souls be ready for the mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? <clears throat> Appreciate your salvation you've extended to us, and we're thankful that that is not uh, just the end of it, that you still work in our lives to develop us and help us to grow and to know you better and to draw us into a ever closer fellowship with yourself. So uh, this evening, Lord, we have a chance to spend time in your word, and we ask that it will be a profitable time. So we uh, commit our service to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. You can be seated. 206, 206. The moment in which you believe that you accept Christ as your Savior, you are not becoming, you do not become a better person. You just become a pardoned one. The Christian life is about growing closer to Him. Yeah. 206. He is coming again. Let's see here. We just going to sing this one. Okay. Lift up your heads, pilgrims are weary. Sea days approach, now crimson the sky. Night shadows flee, and your beloved awaited with longing at last draweth nigh. He is coming again, he is coming again. The very same Jesus rejected of men. He is coming again, he is coming again, with power and great glory, he is coming again. 
again. Dark was the night, sin warred against us, heavy the load of sorrow we bore. But now we see signs of his coming, our hearts glow within us, joys cover on earth or he is coming again. The very same Jesus rejected of men, he is coming again, he is coming again with power and great glory, he is coming again. Oh, blessed hope, oh, blissful promise, filling our hearts with rapture divine. O oh, day of days, hail thy appearing, thy transcendent glory forever will shine. He is coming again, he is coming again. The very same Jesus rejected of man. He is coming again, he is coming again. With power and great glory, he is coming again. Even so come, precious Lord Jesus, creation waits redemption to see. Up in clouds soon we shall meet thee, O blessed assurance forever with thee. He is coming again, he is coming again, the very same Jesus rejected of man. He is coming again, he is coming again, with power and great glory, he is coming again. 508. 508. We'll do chorus after one and four. I am satisfied with Jesus. He has done so much for me. He has suffered to redeem me. He has died to set me free. I am satisfied. I am satisfied. I am satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me as I think of Calvary. Is my master satisfied with me? He is with me in my trials. Best of friends of all is he. I can always count on Jesus. 
can he always count verse three i can hear the voice of jesus calling out so pleadingly go and win the lost and straying is he satisfied with me when my work on earth is ended and I cross the mystic sea, all oh, that I could hear him saying, I am satisfied with thee. I am satisfied. I am satisfied, I am satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me as I think of Calvary. Is my master satisfied with me? We just had a regular week, as I guess you could call it a regular week. We have a prayer service in Kids Compass this week. Um, I did. It's not regular. No, it doesn't seem to be regular. I, I get to the point. I'm not really sure what regular is <laughs> anymore. That's all right. Um, it's all the things we can learn through irregular. You learn some really good lessons that way. Uh, we did get a. a uh, thank you from FEA, Fundamental Evangelistic Association. One of the things that we support is says, thank you again for helping us continue our threefold mission to preach the gospel, teach the word, and, cont and contend for the faith. Your fellowship has been a great encouragement to this ministry. May God give us all the spiritual discernment and courage to speak the truth in love as we anticipate the fulfillment of our blessed hope and seek to do his work faithfully until he comes. May God bless you in the days ahead as we watch for his appearing. And it's signed by Matt Costella. All right, I'll put that on the back table. There's a little bit more information there if anybody's interested. Uh, also, we had a baptism last week. Uh, Rachel Abbott was baptized. And I do have a certificate of baptism I would like to give her tonight. And uh, so I'll have her come forward here and I'll give her this certificate of baptism. And... Uh, don't forget to continue to, to pray for, for them, for her. Thank you. Yeah, you can shake my hand. That's right. <laughs> and uh, it's always exciting to see the Lord working and people being saved. You know, it, it's an exciting thing. And he makes all things new. So thank the Lord for that. All right, uh, that's really it for as announcements go. Uh, maybe, uh, let's see, you don't want to take your offering, Micah? Would you like to take the offering? Not sure. We'll get you next time. Jake, you want to take the offering? All right, we'll get him next time. Who? Quentin wants to? All right. Well, as soon as he can walk. <laughs> all right. Jacob, you want to thank the Lord for all the things he's given to us? Bless the offering. Amen.
have a few moments of uh, sharing testimonies, hymns, stuff like that. I had something I was going to share. Um, so one thing that I've been trying to work on this year is to be more healthy. Um, they're having a weight loss challenge at work. I didn't participate, not because I, c I don't have to lose any weight, but because I don't like stuff like that. I end up being very competitive and gaming the system just to show that I can win. And that's not the point, you know? And uh, so instead of setting myself a target of a particular goal to work at, um, I want to just be healthier, to exercise more, to eat right. Um, and to be more fit and, and healthy as a person, it's occurred to me that that's a good goal for the Christian life for this year too, not to, to marathon and find one good thing, there I found it, and I set it down and go back to living the way I was before, but, but to embrace a lifestyle of living for the Lord, uh, not some quick thing that I just want to get to and win a prize, right? But to live a life that is fit for Him, uh, that is healthy and things of the Lord. Um, and not just some short-term thing that we do and then get back to life as it was. So I appreciate prayer on that. Some, the, you know, you get sick and you decide, okay, I'm not going to get up and do anything today because I just don't feel well. And the next day you feel better, but you still don't do it. You know how it goes, right? Um, so any prayers on that? If you think of it, you work, you're done praying for everybody else in the world and you think of me, I'd appreciate it. Anybody else? 833. Which verse? Don't tell me there's only one and I'm going to look like an idiot. Oh, good. Okay. <clears throat> 833. The burden of sin has been lifted as far as the east is from west. They've buried without remembrance in God's sea of forgetfulness. I've been to Calvary's fountain. My name is written above. When Satan rails accusations, I tell him they're under the blood. They're under the blood. They're under the blood. Christ did for me what I could not do. They're under the blood. Just like the Passover in Egypt land, it took the blood to save man. Wash and made clean, I'm justified when God sees the blood. Reference to the Passover. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Barbara. Thank the Lord for all the kindnesses he shows to us. He's really wonderful. Um, I was thinking about the things we heard this morning, like uh, leaving it with him instead of trying to do it yourself. Yep. Well, he's helped me through two or three more sessions with this first of mine. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. You know, um, it would be really, really difficult without him. And I just praise his holy name. Uh, could we sing 410? 410? Yeah. Yes. Only believe, first verse okay? Okay, you know the Bible says if your hand offends you, cut it off. You don't want to do that? Oh, okay, all right, we're willing to, to wait a little longer. Very good, okay. 410. Fear not, little flock, from the cross to the throne, from death into life he went for his own. All power in earth, all power above is given to him for the flock of his love. Only believe, only believe, all things 
things are possible. Only believe. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Read. Um, can we? On the hill far away. Yep. On the hill far away, 132, I think. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the tears stand best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Jake. I'm thankful for the baby goat. Do you have more or is this the same? More, okay, good. Kay. Can we sing 173? 173. How many more baby goats do you need before you stop being thankful for another goat? Maybe Jim would say just a little more. Okay. 173, is that it, Jake? All right. It cleanseth me. First verse. When they crucified my Savior on the cross of Calvary, there a blessed fount was opened for my cleansing full and free. And my sins were all forgiven just by faith in his shed blood. They are washed away forever by the crimson flood. It cleanseth me, it cleanseth me. The precious blood of Jesus fully cleanseth me. It cleanseth me, it cleanseth me. The precious blood of Jesus fully cleanseth me. Turn over to number eight for a moment. Eight. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Ludwig van Beethoven wrote this one. First verse, just the words. I don't know if he wrote, he didn't write the, the words, just the music, I mean. Beethoven wasn't known for his lyrics. He couldn't think of any, that's what he just, anyway, let's go. Right. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All right, anybody else? Something to share tonight? Time for what, Rachel? <coughs> I'm thankful for Rob this morning. He does not follow the rules of the church service. 
And this morning, at first, I was embarrassed. I was telling Seth this afternoon, I was like, oh my goodness, like, we don't talk during service. <laughs> and then I was like, where's the rule book? Right. right? Rob was taking the sermon and he was applying it to his life. Yes. And we are really good hearers. I'm a really good hearer. But are we doers? And he was applying it right there in the, in the sermon, like, yeah. well, he's busy writing, but that's how he pays attention. And I just, it was convicting. Amen. And it was good, and I'm, I appreciated it. Amen. 876. 876. Any other scriptures or testimonies before we sing this? Josh. I was just thinking during the message this morning um, where we were talking about is the privilege Israel had and the privilege that we have. And um, I was thinking about Romans 11 that talks about the uh, branch, the, um, that they were branches cut off and then we were grafted in and uh it, there's a verse that says um not to boast against the branches um because we were just branches ourselves grafted in right. um just because we believed on the lord and it says if they believed they would be grafted in again too so we have a tendency to boast a lot um how we're better than israel how we're better than the lost world around us and we're all just dead sticks yeah. if we're not grafted into the root of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and anyone that believes can be grafted in. Nobody is, we're all made of the same thing. Right. <laughs> it's just good to think about. I bet. Yeah. <clears throat> My understanding. That's right. Yeah, still sinner, just better off one. Yeah. Amen. Although I maintain that a saved Jew really has it made. If you read Revelation, I mean, <laughs> you pretty much write their own check in heaven from what I can tell. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Are we good? Ready for 876? Emma's got something. Is it a song or just something to say? Okay, we got something to say. This could be good. Okay. And they quote for uh, we have a good day for for us, and I'm glad for Bon Bon to be a good rabbit. Yeah, our bunny's kind of feral. Yeah, Cassie doesn't believe so. Cassie loves the bunny. Okay. Pray for our rabbit. Anybody else? And for those that have to put a hand in the cage. All right. 876, let's stand. <coughs> One and three. In the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face while the storm owls above me and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe. Till the storm passes by When the long night 
night has ended and the storms come no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the calls are all forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe. Till the storm passes by. Please be seated. Okay. I don't know how anybody expects somebody to preach after you sing a song like that. <laughs> That's where you have to ask the Lord for more strength, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 14 because the verses we're looking at, 5 through 14, uh, it's important to know the first few verses. I know we spent time there this morning, but just for sake of review, we need to go over those. Uh, it kind of builds uh, the foundation for the verses we're looking at. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll start reading in verse 1. And this is what it says. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by, of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We'll leave it there. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Our Father, we do need you to bless your word. And uh, by that blessing, we mean to speak to our hearts with it. It's not good enough, Lord, that we just sit here and, and uh, listen. Uh, spiritual progress is active, Lord. We need to be active listeners. And hearing from your spirit the things that need to change in our lives. And uh, we need to be teachable. So help us, Lord, with this. I pray that our time will be productive. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've uh, reviewed this morning some of the privileges that Israel had, and we also took time to review some of the privileges that we have today in the New Testament time period, the time that Christ is building his church, the time of God's grace. And we said that uh, today we actually have greater privileges than Israel had. Some of the things that we have available to us uh, by God are just tremendous and wonderful. And it's good for us to think about those uh, privileges because, you know, the more we think of the privileges God has given to us, the more we appreciate God himself. You know, God is a wonderful God, 
And he does all of this for us because he loved us and gave himself for us. And he's poured out tremendous things for us, both in, for this life and for our enjoyment for all eternity. And the more we think on these privileges, the more apt we are to live in the way that God wants us to live and not uh, live in the power of our flesh, which we are so prone to do. So we've reviewed some of these privileges, and now we, uh, God's record here turns to the faults and sins of some within Israel. And these are mentioned to give us warning, uh, to caution us that we not fall into the same habits that they did, and fall into the same error that they fell into, and draw the displeasure of God upon us, upon whom the end of the ages are come, because we, as believers in Christ, we live in those time periods near the end of the ages. And uh, we are in a unique place, but uh, we need to be careful we not repeat the errors and mistakes that others have made. And for that reason, we have them listed out here for us. We'll begin in verse 5, uh, because uh, 5 down through um, probably verse 10, are different uh, behaviors, I guess you'd call them, that drew the displeasure of God. So let's first look at the fact that these are examples of drawing the displeasure of God. It says, with some of them, some of the Israelites, God was not well pleased. Is God well pleased with you? Is God well pleased with me? Now, that is going to be something that you have to have a clear conscience before God in. The Holy Spirit can make it clear to you and to me whether we're living in a manner that's well pleasing to God. You can be sure that the Holy Spirit that indwells you are going to make you very, he's going to make it very clear to you whether you are pleasing God or displeasing Him. And He's going to afflict our hearts and our consciences when we are displeasing God. And yet, He is going to fill our hearts with joy and peace when our, our lives are pleasing to Him. And so we can be thankful for the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit of God to tell us and, and to convince us in our hearts and our minds where we stand with the Lord in that, in that regard. Uh, it was not with all of Israel that God was displeased. It was, it was with some of them, we're told. You know, it would be wonderful if God was pleased with all of them. It would be wonderful if a, whenever anyone was saved, they went on and faithfully served God and never had struggles with the flesh and the sin nature, uh, that would be wonderful, but it's not realistic, is it? We do have a sin nature, we struggle with that. There are times we don't serve God acceptably, if we're all honest. We do fail from time to time. And when we do, it is not pleasing. we're not pleasing to the Lord, we're displeasing the Lord. Uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12 uh, for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to, I want us to pay attention to verse 28. We're going to be receiving a kingdom which cannot be removed. Praise the Lord for that. An eternal kingdom. You know, we are the citizens of an eternal kingdom that cannot be moved. The kingdoms of this world come and go and, and leaders come and go, but we have the privilege of being part of a kingdom that cannot be moved. And it mentions that in verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, that is the, the help of God, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 
For our God is a consuming fire. All right? Now, it talks about serving God acceptably in verse 28. That's what you want to do, isn't it? Don't you want to serve God acceptably? If you're saved tonight, that should be a genuine desire of your heart, to serve God acceptably. He's so faithful to us. Isn't it be good if I could just serve God acceptably? And then it tells us how that can be done. It says, whereby we may serve God acceptably with what? Reverence and godly fear. Now these are very two important elements to serving God acceptably. They're mentioned by God specifically here. We cannot serve God acceptably if we lack reverence for God and if we lack a fear or a respect for God. That is really a baseline of acceptable service. It is a right attitude toward God himself. And realize that God is Almighty God, and he is, he is the one that saved me, and to have great reverence and respect for God. It is so important that it tells us here that that is how we serve God acceptably. It is with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. You know, he, he has, he's engaged in a work of consuming things that are displeasing to him in our lives. Our fleshly appetites, our fleshly ways, our sinful ways, our worldly ways, our wrong desires. You know, God is in, in, in the work of consuming those things. And he goes about it different ways. But I tell you, he's very effective in, in the way he goes about it. He is a consuming fire. And I trust that you can see God working in your life to consume things that you know in your own heart are displeasing to him and you ought not to be doing. Praise the Lord if he brings that conviction to your heart and you start uh, dealing with those things that God is bringing to your attention. But God loved Israel just like he loves you today. And we cannot... Uh, ignore that fact. Apart from the love and mercy and grace of God, Israel would not exist today. It would have been destroyed in the wilderness. There were times that the, the anger of God was ignited uh, with Israel there in the wilderness. And there were times he, he talked to Moses, I was, separate yourself from these uh, people, I'm going to destroy them. And uh, Moses pled with God for the people of Israel. But you know, God would be entreated for those people because he loved them. I'll tell you, Christ loves the church just like he loves Israel. But it is possible for some, even in his church, to displease him. And that is why we have this account given to us here that we not fall into those habits and those ways that will displease God as believers in Christ living in the church age today. The evidence that God was of God's displeasure with the, some of those Israelites was the fact that they were overthrown in the wilderness. Uh, they lived in a, in a time period of, of God, of the law, where there was quick judgment for sin, uh, we can be thankful we live in the time period of God's grace. Uh, but they, many of them, died and were buried in the wilderness, overthrown there in the wilderness. One of those times we find in Numbers chapter 11. Let's turn there. Now the purpose I'm, I'm turning to this one right at the moment is uh, we sometimes have a way of grading sins as being more severe or less severe. And sometimes we need to have a check on that uh, to, to get a more accurate view that all sin is repulsive to God. In Numbers 11, in verse 1, uh, tells us of, of something that... I think is so common in our lives, we just take it for granted, and maybe we don't even think 
you know, I need to get that straightened out with the Lord. And to think that, that I'm engaging in this is actually being, I'm being displeasing to the Lord. Verse 1 of Numbers 11 says, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of God burnt among them and consumed them that were in the outermost parts of the camp. Our God is a consuming fire, it tells us in Hebrews, right? And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of that place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. I don't know about you, but the first part of verse 1 is troubling to me. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. I want you to think about how often you complain. You know, what I did, I started thinking about how often I complain. And you know what? Habit, uh, it can become a habit of complaining. Always complaining. But what we read here is that when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. That means that complaining is displeases the Lord. It tells us there that it does. And I think this is just one of the, the things that we do on a daily basis that we, we don't really give much thought to. And at the end of the day, we may even neglect to, to confess that to the Lord and to get that straightened out with Him because it's become so much a norm of living. Uh, I'm not to say that everything is just great, in this world, you know, there's uh, some things in, the, in our country that I would complain about. But you know, it's all part of God's plan, ultimately. Uh, things that are happening today, even that are happening against God. God has a, this is all according to God's plan. It's got to take that course for God to accomplish the things that he's going to accomplish. So even in these things that are going contrary to God's word, God still has a plan and purpose in it all. And we can spend time complaining about the days we live in or complaining about things in our lives, wishing that it was different, and usually we want it to be like we want it to be, <laughs> and not necessarily the way God wants it to be. And if it's not the way we want it, we complain. I just want us to think a moment of what we consider to be little things, a complaint or complaining, to realize even that is displeasing the Lord. And it really causes me to stop and sit back a minute in my chair and think, if that displeases the Lord, how much of the way I live my life is displeasing to the Lord? It makes you do a, a little check on, on your life and how you live it, I think that's healthy for us from time to time. And it is, because that, is that not the reason why God has given us these verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? This complaining that they did apparently was on, on some of the fringe dwellers that were complaining, and God's judgment came upon them. But you know, it, it wasn't every single time that there was a complaint that God did, brought this judgment. You find in Scripture that sometimes God takes severe action in maybe an isolated incident to show the severity of the sin in his eyes. If he was to judge everyone for complaining like he did those people, we wouldn't be here today. But God did it early on to set an example for us that we would be warned of the severity of it. To know that this is severe in God's eyes because of the extent God went to, to, to put it down, to stop it. But that also tells us that God is not inclined to be a severe God 
He, he does have to act sometimes in severity, which he did there, but he did it that we might learn from it and that uh, uh, we wouldn't repeat those things. And it tells us that God is a very patient and merciful God because we deserve what they got, quite honestly, as far as justice is concerned and holiness. But the fact that we're not judged like that is evidence that our God is a God that is inclined to be merciful. He's inclined to be a patient God. He's inclined to be a long-suffering God. And he works to, to bring people into a good relationship with him. He gives people a time to, to change, to see the, the error and to change. Praise God, he gives us time to change. We're slow learners. And we're slow to pick up what we ought to be doing. But praise God, he gives us time to do that. And I can see that, uh, the, that patience of God. I, hope, I trust you can too in your own life. But I see it in his, in his dealings with churches and things um, that he doesn't bring judgment right away. He's very patient and he's long-suffering. Now, uh, if it continues unchecked and there is that hard attitude of not being willing to change, then yes, there is a time that God with, will withdraw his blessing even from a church, a local church. He does that. But it is only after he deals with that church for an, what I would call an extended period of time to help them to see the, their error and to change and to be drawn back into a closer relationship with him. That being said, it can be spiritually dangerous for those bent on their own way to presume on the grace of God. That, that is a very dangerous attitude to adopt right there. Uh, that's probably getting you a step closer to having God remove his blessing. It says that, now these things were our e examples. Uh, these, these, uh, this, their sinful conduct was an example for us. <laughs> well, we often think of being uh, examples being good examples, but here we have bad things being an example for us. So these are examples of things not to do, and I don't know about you, but I'd rather be an example that could be pointed to, this is the way you ought to do it, not to be that kind of example where God says, this is what you ought not to do, and uh, to be on that side of things. But God has an intent, then, on these examples. And as we look at them, I think we need to take that, uh, the words of our Lord Jesus, to those that brought the, the woman caught in adultery to him, saying she ought to be stoned, and the Lord telling them, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So uh, as we look at these Israelites, I think Josh mentioned in the testimony he had from Romans 11, uh, in our church age, we may be quick to point the finger and, and be critical but I would encourage us to really do what the Lord intends us to do and have us look inwardly at our own hearts and say, am I guilty of any of this? And am I bringing the displeasure of God upon my, upon my life? And if so, uh, that's a good chance to change direction right there. Praise the Lord when he brings it to our attention. So... Let's look at the clear intention of God here. The, God's clear intention for us is that we not lust as they lusted. They lust after evil things as they also lusted. Psalm 106, 13 through 15 said, They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. And, God, and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Uh, particularly what is in, of, uh, in mind here is when they lusted for meat while God was providing them manna. Lusting for meat instead of being content with what God had for them. 
and what God's plan was for them until they got to the land of Canaan. Once they arrived in Canaan, they would have the, the land flowing with milk and honey. They'd have all sorts of blessings there. But in the meantime, in the wilderness, God's plan for Israel was the manna. But they were not content with that. They lusted for meat. And if you recall, uh, God sent quail. And the quail dropped into the ground all around them. And they ran around grabbing it up, picking it up. And I don't even know if they took time to cook it. <laughs> That's what I'd say. Uh, I don't, maybe they did, but I presume so. But just the same, they weren't long sinking their teeth into the meat satisfying the, the lust of their heart, the physical lust, physical desires, putting that ahead of God. This is putting your, your fleshly lusts ahead of God and what God wants. They died there in the wilderness, and there in the wilderness they were buried. They didn't even have a chance to swallow. It said as soon as their teeth cut that flesh... They, died. they got struck with a plague and died. And this seemed to have been started by the mixed multitude that was there, some of them that were not Israelites necessarily, that came out with them from Egypt, came along with Israel. And here we can see that it doesn't take much of a bad attitude in any camp to really spoil a camp and, and infect the people to a, a bad extent. So we're not to lust after evil things as they also lust. What is quail meat evil? No, you can't say quail meat is evil in, it, in and of itself. What made the quail meat evil? It was that it was not what God wanted for them. And they knew it. They knew God had provided manna. They knew that that was God's plan for them. That is what God wanted for them. But when they said, I want something different. I don't like this. I want that meat. I want some meat to satisfy my fleshly desires. That made it evil. They were trying to satisfy that fleshly appetite. And put that above what God had for them. And that's what made it evil. So what about us? Do we crave evil things? Well, you would quickly say, no, of course not. I don't crave going to the bar and drinking myself blind. I don't crave uh, doing any of these evil deeds or evil works. Well, praise the Lord, if you don't, I'll have to say that there is something in your flesh that does, whether you want to admit it or not, it's there. And we need to deal with that. And we need to allow the Lord to deal with that. Uh, there are wrong cravings that we have because we have us in nature. But are we sometimes wanting things that we know God does not want us to have? And are we bent on that? Uh, that is lusting after evil things, and it's evil only because we know that's not what God wants. But I want it anyway. So, I'll say uh, that we need to be careful with our carnal desires and be careful they don't get a foothold in us. They need to be noticed and checked as soon as possible when they first rise up in us. Because once they prevail and start to, to bear a sway in us, start to really influence us, we do not know the places that it will carry us. If we let desires get a foothold, it can carry us into places that are very evil and very wicked. And carnal appetites indulged in are the root source of, of a lot of sin in this world. Lusting is setting our hearts on things God does not want for us. And these are fleshly desires, prideful desires, worldly desires. So we need to uh, 
know what it is that God wants for us. Quite honestly, he'll want uh, maybe some things for you that he doesn't want for somebody else. Uh, Each life is different. And it is between you and God to know what 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 God wants for you to have and what he doesn't want you to have. But don't step over that bound, that boundary. When you know that it's something God does not want you to have, don't test that line. Be content with what God gives and not lust after what would become evil things. And God's clear intent for us is that we not be idolaters of, as some of them. Well, that's talking about the golden calf. I said the people corrupted themselves in Exodus 32. I was reading that account, and it's quite, I I was struck with something that I never picked up on before. And it talked about how the people took off their earrings of gold and gave them to Aaron. And then Aaron melted it down, had a molten calf. So it had some kind of a form there that that was a calf shape that he was able to, pour that gold into, and it it was molten still. It was still in liquid form when it was in the mold. And then he put the tools to it to shape it after it became hard, apparently, when it was moldable or toolable. And they, which I presume would be the people, said, these be the gods that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. And then Aaron said, well, tomorrow will be a feast day unto the Lord. To me, that was fairly strange. Here he had made this golden calf, and the people said, these be the gods that brought us up out of Egypt. And here's Aaron saying, tomorrow will be a feast day unto the Lord. So they gathered around this calf, they had this feast day unto the Lord while in their hearts thinking that these are the gods that brought us up out of Egypt. I'll tell you what, you say, well, that is totally confusing. What is going on there in Israel? But isn't it just a mixture of the world and worship of God? It just was a, it's just an awkward, confusing mixture of idolatry and supposed feast for the Lord. God was not going to have any part of that. He says the people have corrupted themselves. And one of the reasons is, from Isaiah 42, 8, where God said, I am, I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. There is one God, and he is deserving of all the glory, and he will not give his glory to another. Now, that that tells me that God takes this business of worship very seriously, and this mixture of, of uh, this divided love, this divided uh, uh, prioritizing some things above the Lord, uh, desiring some things more than the Lord, uh, giving credit to other things than the Lord. God says, uh, the Lord says here that the people corrupted themselves. There's a lot of world that can get into our worship of God personally and also in a church. We need to be very careful that we not allow the influences of the world to corrupt our minds and our hearts away from glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ and God and make sure that he gets all the praise and all the glory in all of our services. So that is where we're going to leave it this evening. Uh, 
I would just uh, before we leave it, just point us to the uh, verse 12 where it says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. All right, that's written there for us. All right, that has nothing really to do with Israel. Uh, he's going over Israel's history. But verse 12 is really directly for us. Wherefore, let me if I, that think I stand take heed lest I fall. Yeah. So that's what God wants us to do with some of these things from the history of Israel. Right? Father, thank you for our time uh, this evening. We're thankful that uh, you are God. I uh, pray that we'll uh, take time to meditate upon our own conduct. Uh, consider how these people of Israel behaved and, and realize that they brought your displeasure and be very concerned about ourselves bringing your displeasure and really seek, Lord, to please you in our daily life and in the way we conduct our worship services. Give us uh, that clear ministry of your Holy Spirit showing us what is pleasing to you and what is displeasing in the way that we should go. In Jesus' name, amen. 221. 221. Well, it's more holiness give me. I trust that's a good desire of, of your heart and mine here tonight. So let's stand and we'll close with this hymn. More holiness give me, more striving within, more patience in suffering, more sorrow from sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of His care, more joy in His service, more purpose in prayer, more gratitude give me, in His Word, more tears for His sorrows, more pain at His grief, more meekness and trial, more praise for relief, more purity strength to overcome, more freedom from earth's 